So I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you guys. Uh, as the Boeing company, we, we do a lot of presentations within our industry, and this is a rare opportunity for us to be here in Silicon Valley talking to you folks about our experience and the things that we're doing with this technology stack. Uh, I echo Sanjeeva's excitement about this period in technology. Um, it's an incredible time uh, and a lot of changing paradigms that, that force us all to look at how we solve problems in a new way. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our presentation here. Um, I'm going to cover, uh, basically tell you our journey as we've moved forward with implementing WSO2 and kind of the key learnings I think any enterprise is going to face as they move forward, standing up a SOA infrastructure, a platform as a service to build applications. And also, I would say even learning about the cloud and how to leverage that and the opportunities it presents for your business, right? So first I want to level set in that a lot of folks uh, have heard of Boeing, but what you think about Boeing may or may not match up with what Boeing is. Boeing is a very large company, number one aerospace uh, company in the world, uh, nearly 100 years old. Um, I love hearing Sanjeeva's story about starting up a company, and I, I really loved when I came to Boeing from the software space, hearing about Bill Boeing's story and how he fell in love with aviation and eventually grew a company that now is global. Uh, 170,000 plus employees worldwide in over 150 company, uh, you know, countries, um, and, and definitely a, a lot of revenue involved with what we do. Um, very incredible experience coming from the software world into Boeing and learning about that. I guess the other thing to, to take away from, from a company like Boeing is so half the company is defense, then we also have uh, the commercial space, which is what most people are familiar with. Uh, within the commercial space, we have a group called uh, Commercial Aviation Services. So this is our qu commitment to the customer uh, on quality and, and, and assisting them in managing their fleet in the best way possible to get the most return on their investment and to run the most efficient operation possible with that. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like you to think about when you think about Boeing, like how many people here in the audience flew here today? Can I see hands? Okay, a lot of people flew here today, um, and, and that's great, because you all probably came on different airlines. And one thing I, I think has been incredible for me to learn about Boeing as a company is that we manufacture a plane like, like a 737, and some of you, a lot of you probably flew in on a 737, uh, but your experience was drastically different. And that's because uh, each airline customizes their plane. So when you think about like, really high-end sports cars like, like a Maybach or a Ferrari um, or a, a Maserati, right? Um, the attention to detail, the hands-on passion that goes into building that kind of vehicle is the, is the exact same kind of thing that we put into building an airplane. And each, each customer of ours actually customizes that plane down to the choice of fabrics, the space between the seats, all to fit their business model. So we're very customer-focused very passionate about supporting our customers to run the best business they can. So within commercial aviation services, we, we focus on delivering what we call the Boeing Edge. And the Boeing Edge is taking our holistic view of the industry and packaging that up to deliver the right products, services, and support to our customer base to run the most efficient operation uh, possible so that they can then deliver the best service to you, the customers who utilize the airline. So when we, when we look at the Boeing Edge, we break it down into some functional areas. So material services, uh, very part-centric, maintaining the plane, um, delivering the right part at the right time to keep that plane working and serviceable. Uh, fleet services, anything that touches the plane, the history of the plane, with a focus on maintenance and engineering. Uh, flight services, this is airspace, this is training, this is logistics, helping to do, do uh, flight uh, routing, number of services on that end, and then information services, which is kind of the integration of the different, different products and services we offer within our portfolio. So aviation has been around for a while now, obviously, and over that time, a lot has changed. Uh, and there are, are customer pain points that have evolved in our industry due to the tight margins that you're all familiar with that the aviation world operates within. So 
when thinking about the opportunity and trying to help our customers be more efficient and run their, their operations and, and save them money, we had to look at how do we reduce complexity? How do we better integrate our world-class products that we have that are utilized today and mission critical to our customers? How do we constantly improve ourselves and get better and better and therefore drive that value out to our customer base? So these are, these are common problems that we run into in the aviation world and that you have this wide disparity between uh, maturation, technologically speaking, and capability in terms of some airlines are running uh, very old applications, very old systems, uh, but they work and they're solid. And the cost of moving from that system all the way to a new state is, is very large, right, and complex, and it could disrupt their operation. So they're in a position where they want to start leveraging the new tech technologies that are out there, but they're capital constrained, and they may or may not have the staffing to be able to do that. And so that's where Boeing, we've, we've taken on ourselves to really listen to our customers and help them with these challenges, how to break free their data, how to integrate better with the applications and, and products that we provide to them to create business process driven workflows and new applications. So these are some of the things that we hear from our customers. Uh, real time decision support, knowing what to do when, getting the information to the right person, so that we can keep the operation moving. Because air, the airlines at their core really are a logistics company. So you want to move the plane as fast as possible because you make money when the plane's in the air and moving. No different than a lot of you probably rode in on a taxi cab, right? You, you want to have your customers moving. If you stop, you're losing money. So if the plane, plane needs to be repaired, we want to make that repair quick and efficient. Uh, turn it around and get it back into the air. So, Helping, helping with real-time performance, helping them work on, on business operational uh, improvements, breaking free the data. These are all things that the aviation community as a whole are working to, to try to solve. So our strategy to, to work on this opportunity and this challenge is first connect the airplane. And you can see here a list of some of the products that we have, have in place. And of course, no one knows the plane better than we do. Uh, we built it, and, and we're passionate about that. Um, enhancing the workforce, so helping the folks that work within the airlines to be faster and more efficient and better at what they do to make their experience better. Optimizing the operation, so assisting with uh, our holistic view of the industry to help them select and implement the right platforms to measure analytics and provide them with the data that can give them real-time insight into what they're trying to do as a business as far as improving the operations, turning the plane, um, and ultimately monetizing their activities. And then enabling the, the digital airline, and I'll talk to that in a second. Uh, Airline-wide, fleet-wide, real-time, secure. Our industry is, is very security-focused. Um, we do not have a, a tolerance, for, there's no tolerance for failure. Uh, things have to work, they can never go down. Um, so we place a lot of uh, emphasis on quality control, detail, and every test you can possibly imagine under the sun to make sure that there is, there is no room for failure or error. So this all culminates into our, our vision of what we believe the future is for the uh, aviation space, which is what we call the digital airline. And the digital airline is the idea of helping uh, the airlines reach a state where all of the data from all of the different entities and pieces of their uh, business model are integrated and can then functionally move into the organization to help them make those real-time decisions that they need to make faster and more efficiently. Automate things um, in terms of process, digitize knowledge base, uh, a lot of activities that, that really need to be shared. And this is where we really dovetail into the WSO2 story about breaking the data out, sharing the data, and enabling customers to now interact together. So you can see here leveraging the uh, technology to create customer value. So this is the ecosystem and of course from the plane side out, working with the different areas and within the business, integrating our applications in there. And as part of our journey, we recently went to market with uh, some iPad applications to help line mechanics turn the plane around faster 
once it comes into the gate. So do all their systems checks, make sure everything's operational and functional so the plane can turn around. And that's what happens when you, when you flew into SFO and you were waiting. There was a squad of folks who can't come underneath the plane. They're not just moving luggage. They're making sure that that plane is safe, reliable, everything's operational. Anything that needs to be topped off gets topped off. They, they uh, get the plane ready and turn it around. And so leveraging mobility and being able to deliver that experience and save the time and money to turn that plane around. At the end of the year, the faster you turn around, you might get more runs in. That turns into profit for your business model, right? So lessons along the way. Um, new landscape. When you, when you look at the world as, a, as an enterprise in today's market, uh, big changes coming around in terms of data is now king and an understanding of that. Um, the cloud. So now computing is a utility, and then mobility. Those three strategic vectors come in and really uh, are enablers, but they're also things that you have to kind of weigh some risks in there, especially in our line of business where risk is something that we really have to quantify and account for in everything that we do. So looking at these models, we have to look at the market and say, well, what's really changed and how do we adapt and how do we take our existing world-class products and, and continue to innovate and stay on the bleeding edge of the aerospace world and continue to lead in that area. So information management, right? There's more data than before. Uh, the 787, it, it, per flight, I want to say uh, the numbers are like for a 777, which is a, an earlier model, of course, than the 787. You've got one megabyte of data coming off of the plane uh, per flight. The, the 787, just like everything else in our world, much more data coming off, 28 megabytes uh, per flight. So you can imagine we now know a lot more about that plane and can make improvements and uh, use that data to help the airlines and also help Boeing to build better planes and better fuel efficiency moving forward, which is what our customers really need um, in today's market with uh, gas prices being what they are, fuel. So uh, innovation and disruption, right? Digitization of assets, processes, and people, mobility, cloud solutions, big data and analytics. Boeing has actually been a big data player for quite some time. Um, flying a plane is an amazing thing uh, once you get inside the aerospace community and you start to understand all of the factors and vectors that have to be weighed with a plane, things like wind direction, weather, um, flight patterns, other, other aircraft, uh, all kinds of different aircrafts from the general aviation market, which might be some of you as a, as a pilot at home, all the way up to the commercial end of the spectrum as well as military. Um, we've been crunching that data and using that to improve the plane and to assist with running all those logistics for quite some time. But in this new day and age, the, with the new tool sets, we can do that faster and more efficiently. So that's, that's of keen interest to us. And then behaviors and expectations. We're in this amazing uh, time with uh, usability getting better and better and mobility and applications uh, now being served up to everyone. A, a great example of this is I want to say even five years ago, my mom would never have been able to run an app. And today, she has an iPhone. And so she's generating data. So we now live in a world where we have a consumer experience that's so prolific that everyone has experienced it. So now you really have to think about your B2B, the phrase of a B2B application versus a B2C application, right? Because your employees now expect the same kind of interaction, ease of use that you would get in a, in a B2C type of experience, but they expect that in the workplace. So you have to kind of relook at how you build these things and how you, you uh, design that interface. So integrating products and services, where we took that vision uh, as a product manager, we kind of broke it down into two, two primary areas that we needed to get into, right? Platform as a service, and then infrastructure as a service. So being able to leverage uh, Mobility forces you to get really smart about using services to deliver the content because that my iPhone, as thin as it is, doesn't really have 200 applications on it, right? So you have to learn how to, how do I leverage the advantages of the cloud, the elasticity, the scalability, uh, as well as uh, 
how do I write the services in a consistent manner and get everybody on the same page, so to speak, so that we can deliver that content and take advantage of mobility. So this is where we start also looking at when we work with our customer base, those line mechanic applications actually tie into the maintenance system at the airline, which allows someone to now take pictures, write down what they've done, reference materials, then save those, those uh, activities and that documentation, and then have it integrate into the back office system at the airline. So again, saving some time on process. So this is where we started to look at how do we leverage the platform as a service, but also at the same time look at the cloud and leverage that capability as well. So here, this is a nice mar architecture, Markatune uh, picture of platform as a service, the different components that were necessary for us to stand up, and this is where WSO2 came in, as well as when I referenced earlier that our airline customers have a wide variety of technology solutions and m maturity levels. And so that's where open source was something that we, we had to kind of really focus on taking a, a real strong look at, is we have to have something that is modular and that's open so we can adapt it based on the individual person's need when we perform the integration into our applications so that we can, we can really facilitate them without having to force them to completely rework how they do their business or completely upgrade their technology stack. So our de development direction, where we decided to go, some driving principles. Uh, standing up a service-oriented architecture. So open, modular approach, open source, wherever possible. Uh, but always thinking about the licensing uh, implications. And again, that's where working with WSO2 has been advantageous and that they, they put a lot of thought into that and uh, that's something that we could take advantage of, right? Uh, leveraging emerging technologies. So trying to stay vendor agnostic because as I said before, our ecosystem and our customer base uh, has a wide variety of tools and software that's being implemented. So our solutions, if we're going to be integrating with those systems at the airline, we have to be able to be adaptable and play with a bunch of other proprietary type of systems. So that was important to us as well. Uh, focusing on mobility, that's kind of a no-brainer in today's world. I think it's next year that the sale of mobile devices will surpass laptops. Um, so we're definitely moving to a new direction. I, I'm old enough to uh, tell you I definitely remember the last time I bought a desktop machine at home and moved to all laptops in the house. And I think we're very close to where soon everyone's going to have tablets and your workhorse will be the laptop uh, for sure, right? Um, the other big thing to think about as a, as a driving principle is ad, agile development, which I think has become a new standard for most of us to shoot for, but I think in the enterprise there's different flavors of agile still. Uh, but agile development, taking advantage of an agile infrastructure, and then how that affects your culture and drives into actually becoming an agile business to support that rapid innovation. Uh, and starting with small teams, moving quickly, learning fast, implementing your changes as you move forward. So leveraging a proof of concept, as I said, we started out saying, okay, if we're going to get into this space, let's prove it out. So we started out by building the, uh, the devices for the iPad, the uh, line mechanic applications, and working with customers to actually build those out. Uh, so again, that agile process of staying very closely tied to the customer, meeting with them on a regular basis, gathering that feedback, going back to the drawing board, and continuing to innovate until we ended up with the product that we're going to mar market with today. Um, partnering with the subject matter experts. So in this case, we spent a lot of time with the line mechanics underneath the planes, uh, figuring out what they do, what they run into, what their challenges and their opportunities were. Um, setting short timelines. So again, agile methodology, if you're familiar with it, which I would guess most of you are here in Silicon Valley, very tight milestones to show uh, rapid improvement and uh, key learnings that we picked up along the ways and implementing those changes. And then not being afraid to try something new. A lot of times I think uh, large enterprises come into a situation and they have a preconceived notion of what the customer uh, should do or should want. 
and really uh, forcing yourself to break out of that paradigm and really listen to the customer. What is this guy really trying to tell me when he's underneath that plane when he runs into a situation X, Y, or Z? And then building that into the software. So in this new world, another thing to think about as an enterprise is planning for resources, infrastructure, and DevOps, right? So AWS, you know, and the cloud in general provides some key opportunities for rapid innovation and development. Because uh, in a large organization, normally you have to go through a process to get access to servers, to be able to build your project. So if you're trying to do proof of concept, that can be almost a hurdle to have to get through. Leveraging the cloud, though, now you can spin up servers very quickly. You can run tests. You can do proof of concept work very quickly and then spin it back down. So it's that whole utility model of being able to move very quickly and to, to rapidly innovate. Um, so you have to kind of account for that on two levels, right? On the upside, you have all those advantages I just named. On the downside, you have to make sure that you've got the right governance and controls in place so that people don't overspend on an activity. So that's something to also keep in mind. Uh, the other challenges that we've, we've figured out is the architects and the network designers have to be very tightly integrated in with an app team. So in the startup world, this is normal and you would think that's the way it is. But in a very large organization, there's specialization in different areas, right? And app teams may or may not be deeply involved with the infrastructure that they build within, right? But in this new world, they, you have to take that into account and really think about are we building the app uh, so that we leverage the infrastructure properly and that we don't uh, make too large of a service call, for instance, and pull down a whole bunch of data, which creates a performance issue, right? So you have to start thinking about these things, as well as the cost that's being driven by the movement of the data, the storage of the data, and the processing of the data. So you have to take those things into account in your business model planning, as well as uh, your actual implementation and how you build out and design your application. And then, of course, skill sets. Um, being up in the Northwest in Seattle, uh, we're right next to Microsoft with Azure. We're right next to Amazon with AWS. Uh, but even still, the, the, there's fierce competition for people who really know and understand the cloud. And so finding folks who have that mentality, understand that utility model that it brings to the table, and then applying that and getting a hold of those folks, that, that can be a challenge. So planning ahead, uh, staff up for it, account for it, Know that it might take longer to find the res right resources to bring into the team. Um, be very flexible in your planning as well, right? So, and of course, data, and this is where we come back to the WSO2 story here. Uh, center of the universe, new value stream, right? Uh, the real value that we deliver to our customer base is the right data to the right person at the right time for the problem at hand, right? That's, that's our goal. And in the new, this new day and age, that, that implies a lot of things, right? You have to start thinking about your approvals and what data you, you release through that API. You have to have a, a really good data governance process in place so that you think about that. You protect your, your IP, but at the same time enable the right people to go and do the kind of work they need to do. Uh, and you have to be ahead of that. So planning all of that out is very important. Also with the cloud infrastructure, you also have to think about uh, export control, uh, dealing with different countries, what data can be released where and leveraged how, right, to whom. Um, so what we came down to is really, you know, re recognize that it's a big thing to take on. I know data governance is a, is a tough thing for a lot of folks, um, but you got to focus down on a, on a real case Start with, you know, at the contextual level. Begin your process early if, if you're in an enterprise to get access to the data and the, the right approvals from your leadership and your teams so that you don't get into trouble downstream after you've already built something. And then refine the elements as you go. So don't try to boil the ocean and solve all of data governance, but try and start with the real use case to deliver the value with the application you're trying to design at that time. So a big one for us and, and our industry, our, our customers, our partners, uh, is security. Security is a huge, huge deal to us. So early on, we took that into account in our design and working with WSO2 
and some of the brilliant staff that work with us are here, and it's been a long voyage to get to where we uh, could approve what Boeing would hold as a secure instance in the Amazon cloud uh, for our platform. So that was a huge accomplishment, uh, and, and we had to account for it early on because we knew that it would be a challenge to leverage the public cloud. And that the decision ultimately ended up going all the way to the C-suite. So it was definitely, as you can imagine, a company the size of Boeing that I just referenced at the beginning, quite a journey and quite a, quite a learning process. Uh, but the awesome thing is that if we can do it, you can do it, because Boeing places a huge value on security. We value the security of our IP and want to maintain our position as the leading aerospace company in the world. And we also want to protect our, our airline customers and their data, because we're selling the same models of plane, but as I referenced also in the beginning of, of the conversation, uh, the business model is what differentiates. They're, how they configure that plane, the experience they create for their customer set, their pricing models, that's how they differentiate out there, right? You have a very different experience when you're flying Southwest than Alaska or JetBlue or Virgin, right? So, so we want to protect their business model and in our interactions with them. And so security, again, falls into that. So recognize it early, plan for it, design for it. Um, I'm lucky in that I have a brilliant team of architects that, that pulled this all together and an awesome dev manager, uh, Kevin Smith. He'll be speaking at Amazon reInvent. If you want to learn more about that end of the spectrum, uh, catch him in Vegas in November. Um, don't mistake effort for success, because you're going to have many go-backs in the process as new things are discovered and new understanding is reached. And that a lot of us in this room, probably here in Silicon Valley, you guys are more up on the cloud and on SOA and APIs, publishing APIs. Um, but not everyone here is here in Silicon Valley wrapped around the technology industry or as close to the fire as you guys are here. So uh, education is a long road and you have to help uh, become an evangelist and an advocate within your organization to drive that story out. Um, validate and verify your assumptions. Boeing's very good at that. We have a great uh, risk management process to identify risks and issues early and then have mitigation plans for those. Uh, and that was very helpful in this process for us. And then bring in expertise at, at, you know, if your organization doesn't have that background or knowledge set, Go find it, bring it in. It's great to have a third party come in and validate what your assumptions are already for your organization and to provide key input. Uh, and when you bring them in, make sure that there's a knowledge transfer so that you can carry that forward on your own. So communicating the culture shift, and this is one that uh, is still rippling through Boeing, and I'm sure it's rippling through a lot of organizations at this time as well, is, is uh, with the cloud, you have these new opportunities that I mentioned from a business model perspective, but also how you design things, right? So you've got this agility on your team and building an app. You have the agility now, though, in the infrastructure that you can quickly spool things up and spool them down, right? And you can now react to volatility in different ways than you could in the past. So this means, again, wrapping your head around DevOps and how do we manage this and building entirely new business processes and kind of getting people to think outside of the box. It's much different than having uh, hardware in a server rack that you can touch. Uh, so you, you really have to kind of understand that, set your, your budget and what kind of reliability you want to set with your customer base, map for that. Um, and then recognize that things are going to expand and contract on demand. So that's something you want to build into your models as you move forward. Then the, the utility approach to computing resources is also something fascinating for folks to kind of get used to. Um, you know, the, the Spider-Man saying, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's, that's how it plays out in, with this cloud technology as well, right? Um, you can now spin these things up fast. Uh, but you have to start measuring that performance as well. So your applications have quality standards that you have to adhere to. And you're going to want to stay on top of that as a business uh, so that you don't overrun your budgets or, or the business case that you are setting out to try to achieve. 
Uh, the nice thing, though, is this does allow you to start looking at how you sell your application. In an application mindset, um, a lot of times it's licensing, right, or per seat. But in this new world, you can start to move into billing, uh, you know, based on metering, based on usage. Um, you can give things away for free, and when someone hits it, then you, you know, and sees the value, then they could charge. So new business models have to be accounted for and adapted and built out in the industry. Um, and that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. Also looking at the APIs and the data and the things that you publish and share. There's opportunity there to drive strategic direction uh, and to enable new strategies for how you go to market and empower the companies around you and your, your own ecosystem around your enterprise. So recognizing that and using the APIs and being very thoughtful about what kind of APIs you want to build, what kind of business result do we want to drive, um, and then possibly, depending on your organization, being able, able to actually monetize that activity by selling the API. So that's a new revenue stream to try to get the business to wrap their head around. Because in a lot of enterprises, IT is a support infrastructure, not necessarily seen as a revenue generating activity. And in this new paradigm, there are, there are many ways to now monetize what used to be just a support infrastructure. So really wrapping your head around that writing that up and educating the business on those new opportunities. That's a very key thing to look at. I think my clicker moves here. OK, so in summa summation here, the critical uh, resource for creating value, the objective that we had set out with was how do we create this digital airline experience for our customer base. The enabler for us was to build a, a pass, an open source pass on the cloud so we could leverage that flexibility and in infrastructure, capacity, usage, um, focus on what we're really good at, which is the data, the analytics, the knowledge that we have in the industry, um, and then rapidly develop new uh, opportunities and applications to improve the airline's operations. And the result, of course, is, is what we're starting to see now with these first new applications, this first wave that are coming out right now. Um, we built them really fast, uh, much faster than the rest of the organization is used to seeing under traditional methodology. Um, there's been great reception from the customer base on it. Um, so we're really starting to see the gains of doing this activity. So definitely going to see more of that. So I do have a video to kind of show you the vision of where we've, we're at, and it kind of demonstrates you'll definitely see the story of WSO2 and the data transferring and the, and the uh, experience that we're trying to drive for our aviation partners, where the data flows and follows the business process wrapped around uh, the airplane, servicing the plane, uh, and really delivering the value to our customer base uh, with leaner operations, lower cost structure, and decreasing the complexity that they face today. So with that, I'm going to let these guys queue up the video. There's supposed to be sound. We can imagine sound. There we go.
So hopefully you can see some of WSO2 in that experience. It's a very exciting time, like I said, to be able to deliver that kind of an experience to an organization. Uh, and that's what we're striving for at the Boeing Company, is to really deliver that value. Uh, you can see how the data and the flow of the data is now what's really important. You're crossing devices. You're crossing uh, different applications. You're in, but the, the experience and the flow of the data is the thing that has to be a constant. So just like in your house, uh, you, you have to start thinking in terms of when I turn on the faucet at home, I really care about the water. I didn't think about the faucet. I was thirsty. I just wanted water, right? Data is the same way now in this new paradigm. So it's a very exciting time. I'm very excited about where we've come to with WSO2. Brilliant folks. I love the modular approach. Um, it allows us a lot of flexibility. And I'm very excited about where we're going next uh, with our project. So thank you a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. I think there's a little bit of time for Q&A. I didn't see him flash the, the card at me. <laughs> Good. Any questions? You got to have some questions. Yes, I would say Boeing already is a connected business, but this is going to help us move to the next level on the different solutions that we build, right? Yeah, I think in years to come, for sure, it, it's going to get down to these kind of services are what really drive value. Yeah, there's the mic. He had asked uh, how we see this differentiating us in the future against our competitors um, or other players in the software space. And I'm, I'm agreeing with him that, yes, I, I think that the services you provide wrapped around your, uh, your offering, in this case, our planes, is a real differentiator because you're not just buying a Boeing plane, you're also buying that it's the most efficient uh, plane for you to operate in your business, which means the services, the data, the connectivity, it, it, it carries more cost savings to you to buy a Boeing plane than not. And it's those products and services that help you to do all of that. So very important and I think it's a differentiator for us now because I think we have world-class services and products and it's just going to get better from here. Any other questions? Yep. Running. Someone over here. Um, first of all, I think that was a great presentation and a company like Boeing putting um, so much faith in WSO2 should give us all quite a bit of reassurance. But my question is, um, having used WSO2 in most of your past layer, um, what has been your challenges in deploying it in the deployment side of um, moving it into the cloud? Um, so some of the challenges we faced, I kind of touched on in the presentation, wrapped around my dev teams, ramping them up on a new technology stack, getting adoption within the organization to utilize the stack, the understanding of how to start working in a SOA model, if you haven't done that you know, with some of your legacy applications. Um, so those have been challenges with the implementation that we've made some great traction and progress. I know we're going to continue to do that moving forward. Um, the other challenge, I guess I'd say, with the product itself, it's a, it's a great product. It's open source. But open source, there's always going to be some challenges there as well with skill sets and mapping and understanding. And then I would also say that Boeing, uh, being the company that we are and being that we're very secure, we're probably doing some things with WSO2 that a lot of folks won't. <laughs> and that's just because we're, we have different standards, a different model. But again, I see that also as an advantage for the product that WSO2 has and the vision that Sanjeeva shared earlier today. I think that's an advantage to be modular enough to adapt to different business models and needs, leveraging the open source. So challenge and opportunity at the same time. Any other questions? Uh, uh, can you go into a little bit more details on what exact WSO2 products you have used so far and what you're planning to use? Uh, so right now we're implementing the whole stack of WSO2 in our PaaS offering. So that's what we're using internally to build our applications and we're using the, uh, all of the WSO2 products at this point. We've, we've stood them all up. Um, now we haven't, when I say usage, I should be careful there. We haven't actively used them, but we have implemented them because we anticipate that folks will be using all of those various components. 
things. Couldn't hear that. Uh, you have around 20, WSO2 has around 20 plus uh, offerings, so you're planning to use all of them in your stack, correct? Uh, yes, at some point, I could see where we're gonna be leveraging, like I said, our, our ecosystem within aviation is so diverse uh, that there's, there's a need for flexibility in how you put these solutions together, like Sanjeeva had explained. Um, reconfiguring it to fit the different scenarios, cost models, technology constraints, uh, business constraints that our customers have. So again, being malleable, I, I think it's safe to say uh, on the scope and scale that Boeing is dealing with, uh, high probability that we're going to use everything at some point based on the applications and the services we, we provide to our customers. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> yes, how did you arrive at the decision to choose WSO2 versus other open source options? Um, so WSO2 was stood up. They were documented, like they'd mentioned. Uh, the analysts had, had write-ups on them, so they were relatively mature, because maturity is an important thing to Boeing as well. Uh, we are very risk-averse, like I'd said. Um, the other thing was looking at open source, because again, like I'd said before, flexibility, being able to adapt, and being able to do what we need to do with the product to build our new applications and, and get closer to our customers and integrate based on their unique needs. That kind of drove us to the open source world. Um, the advantages we had with WSO2, I would say also, is that they've been in the space for a while. Um, they're offering a comprehensive platform versus just individual components, but they give you the flexibility to use individual components. And in short order, I guess as a product manager, I didn't think that you know, it made a lot of sense to try to go and build a solution by cobbling together a bunch of things. Having one vendor, one, one company that we can go to that has a deep knowledge and expertise in that area is a huge advantage when you're looking at open source. So having a good, good strong partner I think is an important part as well. So those were kind of the, some of the drivers behind our decision for WSO2. Any other questions? Thanks, Jim. So um, are, do you have any plans then to expose some of these APIs, not out just to, to your customers, but also to FAA, other government agencies, <laughs> airports, is that? That is a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have my own personal thoughts on that. Right now, no. We're not, we're not actively doing that right now. <laughs> and, uh, just one but follow brilliant follow idea. I like <laughs> where you're going. Watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other follow-up question. For, um, for the silos of data that you've talked about, and, and we're similar organization, pretty large, um, is it data service as a server that really enable you to, to open up the, those silos? Or what's well, the so data? that's where I don't know. This is the day one. I don't know if you were in the tutorials earlier um, or if you're working with WSO2. But if you get the chance, you should really look at App Factory. I think that's pretty awesome. It's not ready for release yet, but I really want these guys to get that out there. <laughs> and then also they partnered with Code Envy, and the two things together are pretty brilliant. Um, as far as right now, you're right, WS2 is these different components. And so for a dev team, especially in a large enterprise where the skill sets might be siloed, knowing where to go to do what can be, could be a challenge, right? Um, but App Factory and where they're going with that kind of wraps it all together into a really easy experience for a dev team to come in and just build, but have a preset list of here are your environments, here are the APIs you can use, here are your teammates, so that when you come into that experience, all these things are provisioned for you and you can just start deving, right? And then they've got, with Code, en with Code Envy, you've got a cloud-based IDE where, again, you can configure that and have that dynamically generated so everyone's using the same tools on the same configuration, you know, alleviates a lot of configuration management issues, um, and you can preload libraries and different tool sets. So I'm really excited about that combination. Um, so I'm waiting for these guys to kick it out the door. Some folks over here. Is it working? <laughs> OK. Uh, good presentation. Thank you very much. Just uh, one quick question along your journey. How did you find the level of support from WSO2 in what you're trying to achieve? Uh, can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, so we started with their Quick Start program, and, we, and they've been awesome in giving us what I know has to be their A team uh, to come in and help us. And the support's been fantastic. Uh, the guys have been on site, because again, security is a big thing for us, working with us, uh, integrated right in with our teams. Uh, they've been fantastic on that level. Um, real, real code warriors work crazy hours to push this thing out for us. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with the support that we've been getting from WSO2 on that front. You know what, uh, maybe an extension to that, uh, were you able to realize your real world scenarios out of the box or did you have to customize, you know, branch out and customize the code? Um, we've done some customization, but like I said, we're, our company's different, the way we have our business processes, our culture, the way that we do the things that we do. So there's been some customization that we've had to do to enable what we do. Maybe just an example or two. Um, well, like I said, some, our, our security model is very robust. And so we've had to you know, develop an infrastructure to kind of suit that. And so I know that we've had to do some work with WSO2 on getting that to all marry up. Now, we're not using Stratos 2 yet. Um, that's in my next two sprints. I'm going to start standing that up. So I'm excited about that because I know that there's been a lot of things that have changed in Stratos 2 versus what we're using now. Any other questions? They still haven't flashed the nasty time card at me. <laughs> Identity and access management. Do you use WSO2's product there? If so, how? Uh, yes, we do use the identity server right now. Can't go too much into that. Uh, security, again, being what it is. But we are using the uh, identity server at, at, uh, from WSO2. I, I don't know where you'd want to go with your questions. That's kind of hard for me to. You, you probably have other identity and access management. Uh, yes, as Boeing as proper, well, right? we definitely do, right? So work on that side, single sign-on, federated identity. Um, we're still looking at that. And then we also have a broad range of uh, subsidiaries and looking at those as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we've got a gentleman over here. Yes, hi. Uh, uh, for your project, is it like are you refactoring your existing system to use WSO2, or was it a new initiative altogether? And, it, and how long it has taken for you to, to put your product in production using WSO2? So we did uh, two things at once. We were building the apps as we stood up WSO2. So we did the whole thing in a, a year, building out the applications, um, and, and standing up WSO2. <laughs> he had a follow on there, I think. Take the so mic. Perhaps we can take one last question before we break. One more. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone up for it? OK. Well, what are some of your challenges uh, bringing your team together, working with WSO2, specifically uh, a situation where your existing te technology stack is different than what you're trying to bring from the open source, and you don't have that uh, uh, knowledge base built into your team right now. Did you have to face that kind of situation? Um, we, had, we started it, kind of like I said earlier to the prior question, as a, a, a new exercise. So there wasn't as much of that. And of course, when you're working with data services, with APIs, right, you're kind of extracting yourself away from from those proprietary tools. You're just getting at the data. That's where uh, this new world is so exciting, right, is there's a lot more flexibility in this new world. So we didn't really run into that as, a, as an issue, per se. Now, I would say culturally, there's, there's desires from folks to use different components. And I think that there was some work that we had to do culturally with getting people to understand that just forklifting something into the cloud doesn't necessarily provide the cost savings. Uh, that people would think that it does, right? You really need to re-architect your application to live in the cloud to see the true value and the cost savings. So there's been some work around that and getting folks to understand that. It's a cultural shift, a mind shift. Um, and, and that's something that'll probably go on for quite some time as folks have to get used to using a new tool and a new design methodology moving forward.
We good? Thank that you. it? Jim, thank you very much. <laughs>